This video is brought to you by Verve. After eight seasons and 73 episodes, Game of Thrones finally came to an end on May 19th, 2019, with the final episode, The Iron Throne. In the day and age of binge watching, Game of Thrones felt like the last popular example of appointment television since Breaking Bad went off the air in 2013, and the last popular example of a show shrouded in mystery, twists and turns, and deep-seated mythology since Lost went off the air in 2010. Game of Thrones was admired for its terrific ensemble of characters, sharp dialogue, elaborate set pieces, action sequences, and the way it consistently defied story expectations, most notably at the end of season one, when the show killed off its protagonist in Ned Stark. Fan ratings on IMDb were consistently stellar throughout the run of the show until the final season, with the final three episodes receiving by far the worst ratings of the entire series. Now, IMDb isn't the perfect rating system, any list that has Avengers Endgame rated as the 17th best movie in film history, while Jaws is all the way down at 238, has issues. But it still helps give an indication into general audience reception. The final few episodes were met with an outpouring of scathing reviews from fans who expected much more from their beloved show. A show many considered to be the best show of all time. So where exactly did Game of Thrones go wrong? Season 7 was the first season that received considerable backlash for the show's creative decisions. Ed Sheeran's cameo was met with a collective cringe. It's a pretty song. I've never heard it before. It's a new one. Character decisions like Jon Snow's plan to venture out beyond the wall in order to capture a single White Walker seemed idiotic and implausible. And the show began to severely alter the pace of characters across the space of Westeros, with some characters traveling seemingly thousands of miles in a single episode. But I'll come back to this issue later. In my opinion, all of those issues were forgivable, and didn't detract from what was another fantastic season. The real problems began to stack up in Season 8. It was a season plagued with both minor annoyances and major issues. Minor annoyances like cups and plastic bottles being left visible within the frame, and the dim lighting that shrouded the season's third episode, The Long Night, in almost perpetual darkness. Now, maybe to you, these aren't minor annoyances. You might think that they speak to the last season's overall lack of attention to detail. Here's why I think they're minor. Continuity and production mishaps happen all the time. Some that immediately come to mind are in North by Northwest, where the child extra preemptively closes his ears before the gunshot even goes off, and in Pulp Fiction, where the bullet holes are clearly visible in the wall behind Jules and Vincent before the gun is even fired. Mistakes happen. It's all part of the suspension of disbelief that audiences must undertake when watching a story. Plus, simple mistakes like the cup and plastic bottle are easy fixes. Since those two episodes premiered, they've both already been digitally removed. As for the dim lighting in the episode The Long Night, I'd argue that dim lighting was exactly what cinematographer Fabian Wagner was trying to achieve. It added to the themes and aesthetic of the episode. Good and evil, light and dark, fire and ice. Darkness was beautifully harnessed to help tell the story. It was the Dothraki's torches being snuffed out that signaled the ominous threat of the approaching White Walkers, and the icy windstorm that made it difficult to see also helped us sympathize with Jon and Daenerys as their vision was purposefully obstructed by the enemy. Personally, I didn't have an issue with the lighting because I watched the episode on my TV at night with all the lights off. It's hard to cater to an audience that watches content on such a wide variety of platforms, like televisions, computers, cell phones, and can choose to watch said content anywhere at any time. Allowing cinematographers to make creative choices that fit their vision and help tell the story is worth it. Otherwise, cinematography will be reduced to the blandest, lowest common denominator. When you're trying to watch something you care about, put yourself in the best position to succeed. This has been your Elk Tip of the Day. The major issues of the final season boil down to two main elements, pacing and character arcs. And these two major issues were never more apparent than on May 12th, 2019, in the episode The Bells the day I believe Game of Thrones died. First, pacing. Game of Thrones was a show known for its big action sequences, but at its heart, it was a show about conversations. Two people in a room, and how the power of words can be wielded to form alliances and start wars. It was the definition of slow burn storytelling. Over the course of a season, or even multiple seasons, the chess pieces were slowly and deliberately moved in their proper places so they could take action. And it was in these scenes that the show was able to effectively build up the characters while simultaneously feeding the story. We were given character relations, motivations, and exposition. 
And by giving the audience this information, the big moments of action carried more weight because we cared about the characters involved. We knew why characters were doing what they were doing and what was at stake. It was this methodical pace that made Game of Thrones stand apart. For example, in Season 1, there's a whole storyline involving Catelyn Stark having to negotiate safe passage for Rob's army across the trident at the Green Fork from Walder Frey. It was this attention to detail that made the show feel authentic. The creators didn't just wash over these details. Every moment was earned, and the show was better for it. In the first six seasons, movement across Westeros and Essos was slow and methodical. But starting in Season 7, the pace was severely altered. Movement was blurred, and storylines were rushed. Jamie Lannister was jumping around from King's Landing to Highgarden, while Jon Snow popped in between Winterfell and Dragonstone, as if they were next-door neighbors. And in the Season 7 episode, Beyond the Wall, time and space was almost completely thrown out the window. When Jon and his fellow hunters realize that they're outmatched, Gendry runs all the way back to the Wall, sends a raven that flies halfway across Westeros to Danny and Dragonstone, who then hops on her dragon and flies all the way up to Jon beyond the wall in what appears to be a single night in the story, but only takes 17 minutes in the episode. I understand that this is a fantasy story, and I already stated the importance of audiences' suspension of disbelief earlier in this video, but it's this inconsistency with the story's established pace over six years that feels jarring. And this pacing issue only got worse in Game of Thrones' final season. Time and time again, Game of Thrones reminded the audience of the approaching danger of the Night King and the White Walkers. It's their presence and threat that kicks off the very beginning of the entire series. The creators invested so much time throughout the series, building up this unstoppable force, but then in the episode The Long Night, they're defeated in a single episode. And when it was all over, I couldn't help but feel a resounding meh. Part of that might be because expectations had been built up to impossible levels after promising this battle for over seven seasons, but I think the biggest reason this battle felt underwhelming was because the stakes weren't clearly defined. There must be something at stake in order to create drama. If we don't do X, then Y will happen, which means Z for our characters. Instantly, the audience has something to connect to and care about. In the episode, we're told if we don't fight to protect Bran, then the Night King will conquer the world, which means that our collective memory will be erased. First, the characters don't really explain any kind of real fighting strategy, so we're just watching people and monsters clash into each other. And then the idea of the Night King conquering the world and erasing memory is far too vague and intangible. I don't really even understand what it means or what that looks like, so it's difficult to put my finger on it and feel the weight of it. Since this entire battle was rushed and crammed into a single episode, these important story beats weren't given the proper time for exploration and understanding. Another way the quickened pace of the final season hurt Game of Thrones is that it robbed the audience of precious moments with the characters. We weren't able to understand how they felt about particular situations, which also meant that we lacked clarity for the motivations that led to their eventual actions. For example, Sandor and Arya venture off together from Winterfell down to King's Landing after the battle with the Night King, but we don't see them again until they eventually arrive at King's Landing in the next episode. In past seasons, we would have spent time with them on that long journey. We would have been given insight and perspective into how they're feeling, and would have laid out clear goals, plans, and stakes. But we're not given any of that, and so those story elements are left vague. We're kept at arm's reach, disconnected from the characters, as opposed to experiencing these moments and emotions alongside them. By far the most damning example of this pacing issue was with Daenerys Targaryen. A character whose descent into madness, which should be the show's most dramatic story revelation, happened almost entirely off-screen, with little to no explanation or motivation in basically two episodes. Which leads me into my next major issue with Game of Thrones' final season. Second, character arcs. A character arc is the inner transformation of a character over the course of a story. The character begins as one sort of person, and gradually transforms into a different sort of person as a direct result of their experiences and choices within the story. Some classic character arc examples are physical, where the underdog character rises to the top, like Rocky Balboa, emotional, where the immature or inexperienced character battles their inner demons to become a better person, like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life, and egotistical where the worst parts of a character are intensified until they become the worst version of themselves, like Walter White in Breaking Bad. The final season of Game of Thrones saw the remaining characters' arcs come to a close, and even though a few of them were done exceptionally well and fit the characters, like Theon Greyjoy and Sandor Clegane, a vast majority of them were poorly executed and some even betrayed the characters themselves. 
Jon Snow's story of bastard to true heir of the throne was amazing. But the entire last season, he was reduced to a passive character, watching everything happen around him. Cersei Lannister also became a passive character in the final season. For a character who was always one step ahead of everyone else, scheming and manipulating her way to the top, she spent the vast majority of her little screen time in the final season simply staring out a window. For some reason, her one and only plan was to bank entirely on scorpions to slay the one remaining dragon. She did virtually nothing right up until the point where she was buried under rocks. Jaime Lannister's arc is personally the most disappointing for me. His transformation from the golden boy, ruthless kingslayer, to a vulnerable, sympathetic character seeking redemption made him one of the most fascinating and endearing characters in the entire story. But in the final few episodes, his arc is completely thrown out the window as he decides to go back to Cersei and ultimately die alongside her. And again, I think the show's biggest betrayal was in their handling of Daenerys' character arc. Personally, I didn't mind the final destination of Dany's character. Taking the Breaker of Chains and transforming her into a power-obsessed tyrant would make for a wonderful character arc. The problem is that creators David Benioff and D.B. Weiss didn't earn that transformation. Here's an excerpt from The Anatomy of Story by John Truby regarding character arcs. Character change doesn't happen at the end of the story. It happens at the beginning. More precisely, it is made possible at the beginning by how you set it up. In other words, the main character doesn't suddenly flip to being someone else. The main character completes a process, which has been occurring throughout the story, of becoming who she is in a deeper and more focused way. Effective character change is slow and methodical. But Daenerys suddenly flipped from leader to tyrant in what seemed like two episodes. The writers threw a lot of obstacles at Daenerys all at once. No support in the north, the threat of Jon as the true heir, Jorah killed, Rhaegal killed, Missandei killed, betrayal by Varys. It's a lot, I get that. But since the final season was so rushed, there wasn't the usual time to ruminate and examine each of these obstacles. They wash over both her and the audience in a small amount of screen time. When the episode The Bells begins, we're just told flippantly that Daenerys has been isolated for days in her chamber. She hasn't seen anyone since we returned. Hasn't left her chambers, hasn't accepted any food. We don't even get to see this isolation firsthand. We're just told it. And since we don't get to experience that full transformation into madness with her, it makes her ultimate decision to burn everything and everyone in King's Landing feel all the more out of character for her. As John Truby says in his book, this final transformation of Daenerys should complete the process of what's been occurring since the very beginning of the story. But this isn't the process that's been laid out to viewers since the beginning, even though the creators would like you to think that it is. Danny had been cold and calculating in the past, but it was never violence for the sake of violence. Violence was only ever tolerated when someone oppressed her, like the Tarleys, or oppressed others, like the Sack of Ostapor. Whenever there were random acts of violence, like when her dragons killed a little girl in Slaver's Bay, she immediately chained them up. There were moments of foreshadowing, like the vision of the Great Hall in ruins, with what we now know as ash falling from the sky, and the common expression, Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. These are all bits of random foreshadowing, but foreshadowing is not character development. It can't be wielded like a trump card in your back pocket that you can just throw down at any moment to justify wild leaps in character transformation. When the bells were ringing at King's Landing, there was no difficult decision between Mercy and the throne. She had both. The people already surrendered. So what was it about the bells ringing that made her go full-on Mad Queen? We weren't given any clear indication for her motivation. And because of that, her decision felt like a betrayal to the audience and the show. The television show passed the book series by George R.R. R. Martin with season six. And because of that, Martin told HBO and the creative staff a general outline of how his storyline would continue and eventually end. Because of that, this final season feels like Benioff, Weiss, and the rest of the writing staff were forcing their writing towards a specific endpoint, as opposed to naturally writing for the characters and their already established arcs. And so Daenerys became a villain because, well, the show needed a villain, not because of thoughtful payoffs over time. It was indicative of the writing style across the final season, which continually focused more on shock than story. After Danny's character-altering decision, we only see her basically for two more scenes in the entire series. Her speech scene, and her death scene. Again, it felt like the show glazed over this monumental moment to deliver a hasty resolution. And because of that, I couldn't help but feel emotionally unattached from everything. 
The last great episode that perfectly encapsulated Game of Thrones' strong elements was in the episode A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. It was an episode that allowed itself to focus on character, like the knighting of Brienne, which was a highlight of not only the final season, but the entire series. A majority of the strongest moments in the final season revolved around two characters in a room, talking, debating, scheming. The first six seasons of Game of Thrones each had 10 episodes, season seven had seven episodes, and season eight had only six episodes. Because of that, the show that was once defined by its conversations, methodical pacing, and strong character arcs quickly devolved into a show that focused more on empty shock and spectacle. Which is exactly what happened on May 12th, 2019. The day Game of Thrones died. This video is brought to you by Verve. Verve is a service that pulls together a ton of great content from channels like Crunchyroll, Rooster Teeth, and Nerdist. If you're a fan of anime, cartoons, gaming, and other unique content, I can't recommend it enough. And right now, Verve is giving my viewers the opportunity to check out Verve Premium for free. Click the link in the description below or go to vrv.co slash the elk to start your 30-day free trial of Verve Premium. With that, you get first access to new content, offline viewing capability, and can watch content on your Xbox, PlayStation, iOS, and Android device by downloading the app. I just finished watching the series My Brother, My Brother and Me, based on the hugely popular podcast where three brothers take questions and try to offer some semblance of advice as each episode quickly spins out of control. It's hilarious if you love weird, twisted humor like I do. And right now, it's only available on Verve. So again, click the link below or go to vrv.co slash the elk to start your 30-day trial of Verve Premium. Tuesday is new video day here on Entertain the Elk, so make sure you hit subscribe below, but also hit the bell button below so that way you don't miss any new videos whenever they come out. YouTube has moved away from the subscriber model, so even if you are subscribed to Entertain the Elk, YouTube's not guaranteed to share my videos with you all the time. But clicking the bell below fixes all of those stupid issues, so again, click the bell right now so that way you don't miss any new content whenever it comes out. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it with a friend, and leave me a comment below. Tell me when you think Game of Thrones died. Or maybe you don't think it died, maybe you thought it was great all the way through. A couple of quick announcements. Check out my ASMR relaxation channel, it's called Quiet the Elk, where I read books, poetry, screenplays, and anything else to help you relax and fall asleep. Click the blue elk button below so that way you can go check out that channel. And I'm taking the month of June off because I'm gearing up to direct this short film that I wrote that's going to happen at the end of the month. But in the meantime, please leave me comments below telling me what you'd like to see me explore next in this Day Something Died series. Thanks again everyone for watching and I will see you all next time.